Good afternoon and welcome. We're in studio again and uh, this week uh, we're talking a lot of different things. And Val, how are you doing tonight? Doing great. Made two trips to Fort Wayne this week, but glad I made them because the game I saw last night was the soccer game of the year. Uh, or several years. Or several years. Yeah. It was something else. Yeah, we'll talk about that uh, as we talk sports with Val here tonight. We've got a lot of stuff going on. We're going into week eight of the football season. We have tennis results to talk about. We have girls and boys soccer both in their sectionals started this week. We've got volleyball draw that happened on Sunday. We're going to be talking about that as the volleyball sectionals begin next week. Uh, we're going to be getting some football draw information coming up this weekend. So, I mean, it, it is coming down to the end of the fall season in a hurry here so we've got a lot to talk about here tonight and um, you know let's start off with uh, the Rochester Zebras they hosted Northfield last week homecoming uh, you know it didn't start off the greatest obviously with a uh, run back of the kickoff but right, uh, not what you would like to ever start a game and especially not what you would like after two weeks off Right on the first play after two weeks off of the opening kickoff gets returned eight, 88 yards for a touchdown. A by little, Mason Fisher. Yeah, a little bit, uh, a little bit scary there for the zebras. You know, it was a big first half for Northfield. Um, you know, the final score Northfield won at 28-21, but I think Rochester mm-hmm. kind of settled in uh, about halfway through the first half. They finally, you know, okay, hey, we can do this and. I don't think you want to take moral victories away, but obviously, if you look at the score from the game last year when it was sixty-two to nothing, mm-hmm. I mean that was a uh, massive improvement. I, I look at uh, about four plays in that game uh, that were really critical. Obviously, the the run back, the uh, onside kick that uh, it looked like Rochester had, but the uh, Northfield kid ended up coming up with mm-hmm. the. Um, um, in the uh, fourth quarter with the first down or the fourth and one and the zebras were not able to get it and then on the other side a few minutes later where the Northfield faked the punt and did get it and then ended up going down and scoring you take those four plays you know I, Rochester probably wins the game and let me throw a fifth play out at you the play after the fake punt mm-hmm. they convert a fourth and three on a fake punt and then the next play Halderman gets around Gets around the corner, gets about 20 yards, and then fumbles. Mm-hmm. And Gosher, the same guy who recovered the onside kick, also recovers Halderman's fumble. Right. I mean, if Rochester jumps on that fumble, right. I think at the very least the game goes to overtime. Right. So, I mean, it was a, it was a, a back-and-forth performance. Great second-half uh, performance there. Uh, I keep looking at the, the start of the third quarter for Rochester and, and coming out, and Coach Schaefer... He makes some adjustments uh, at halftime, and they came out and really played different in that second half. Yeah, and they were able to get uh, some plays going on the outside. Gavin McKee ran a a sweep for a touchdown. We were kind of wondering, can they get some plays going on the perimeter? Can they have some success? They did. I don't know if they had the big, you know, 40 or 50 yard runs, but, you know, Gavin McKee, they, they did have some success, and that opened things up inside the tackles for Deming. I mean, still, it was a season-low night, but he still had 113 yards rushing against a defense that was loaded up to stop him against a very good defense that had won four games in a row, and then now they've won five games in a row. Uh, Rochester, I think, had listed something like 45 players on their roster. Northfield listed 31. Looking on the sidelines, there were not 31 kids in uniform. It was probably closer to 25 or even in the low 20s, probably in terms of who actually stepped on the field, who Coach Baker had faith in, probably around 20 to 22, maybe. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe Rochester wore them down a little bit. Yeah. Uh, I talked with Coach Brandon Baker after the game in Northfield. He said, man, you cannot – we tried tackling Deming by the shoulders. You can't do that. Mm-hmm. I mean, he will just shake you off and, you know, go down, go down the field for an extra three, four, five yards. And, you know, you got to tackle him low. Uh, but they did a good – but, again, when they had to – again, when they had to make the plays, the fourth and one stop and then the fake punt, those were just so crucial. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they, they didn't tackle him by the shoulders on that fourth and one play. Uh, they they had the right defense set up for that, and uh, you know yeah. that was a big stop for them. And right, and it was it was frustrating from a Rochester standpoint. Goshard had a huge game the previous game against North Wabash, like 171 yards and four touchdowns. Rochester 
kept him in check for the most part. He didn't have any many big gains. Mm-hmm. I mean, <laughs> Kasher's biggest contribution were the two fumble recoveries, mm-hmm. or the onside kick recovery and the fumble recovery. So, yeah, tough one. Uh, you know, definitely a learning experience about about the you know the attention to detail you have and about yeah, it's one thing to beat a team by thirty point you know thirty or forty points like you had against Whitco and, and against Wabash. Yeah, that, those games don't come down to one play. Mm-hmm. But when you play face teams like Northfield, it is going to come down to one play. And I think that'll help them in the postseason because sectional looks to be pretty tightly compacted. There isn't one clear, obvious favorite, and there isn't one, there aren't many pushover teams in that sectional either. Right. Yeah, they seem to be stacked pretty close. So it, it might come down to that where, you know, something like that with you have one play that goes one way or the other can determine the end of the result of the yeah. game. I talked with Ryan Schaefer earlier this week. I said, what? Uh, how would you rate your offensive line against Northfield? He said, I'd give him a B. Mm-hmm. So definitely he wants them to get better. But, uh, you know, they definitely they definitely improved. They were definitely better in the second half and in the first half. But, uh, again, sort of a little, you know, angles. Especially in the wing tee, it's, it's, it's footwork and angles. It's not mm-hmm. about just pancaking a guy. Right. As we've talked about in a lot, and so yeah, he gave him a B. So we'll see if they can improve uh, this week as they take on North Miami. Room for more improvement, but they definitely improved, obviously, from where they were last year after the Northfield game. So oh yeah, yeah, and again, in a lot of ways, this Rochester team is younger this year than they were last year. Mm-hmm. Well, they're going to be headed down to Denver uh, tonight. They take on the zero and seven North Miami Warriors and. Should be a, a good opportunity for uh, the zebras to work on some of those things. Right, North Miami is just really struggling. They've been just decimated by injuries. You know, Landon Hunt, who I think was supposed to be their starting quarterback at the start of the year, I, I believe his dad and Ron Schaefer went to high, Landon's dad and Ron Schaefer went to high school together at North Miami. Uh, well, Landon's out, I think, with a collarbone injury, so he's done for the year. Hopefully, he can come back for basketball season, but. So they're on a backup quarterback, and from what we hear, they've been dressing fewer than 25 kids. I think Coach Grant had about 30 to in the 30 to 35 range at the start of, back in early August, but I think he's they're just down due to numbers to, uh, due to injuries. So numbers wise, might be an issue, and they've just had trouble stopping teams. I mean, you know, 72 to 22 weeks ago against McConaughey, 48-7 last week against Wabash, they were down 48 nothing at halftime. Uh, so we'll see if. We'll see if the Rochester running game can get back going again. And let's see, I'll be curious to see if Rochester tries to pass the ball a little bit more. Um, you know, uh, uh, Ron Shaver just raved about Aaron Swango, about his performance. I mean, not only did he throw the touchdown pass, he he said, we had been practicing that play in practice three, like two, three, four weeks. Mm-hmm. We were just waiting for the perfect time to run it. And as you saw, it was the perfect time because yeah. Antonio Schlosser got wide open in the end zone. And then on the very next play, the very first play of Northfield's next drive, what an interception by Aaron Swango as he intercepted Fisher's pass on a halfback option play. So, uh, yeah, Aaron Swango's, his, he, he keeps stepping up and contributing more and more each week. And his brother, and Ron Schaefer praised his twin brother too. Eli, has, Eli Swango's been playing great on the defensive end. The linebacker play, I think, has really improved. Yeah. So we'll see if, the, if, if they can stop that North Miami offense. Because, you know, when you talk about Coach Joe Brand and his offense, they, they, can, they can always do a lot of different things. I mean, there's... Um, you know, the, the running game is a big part, but um, they'll do that, uh, what Coach Shaver calls it, orbit motion, when the guy, you know, he's not running a straight line behind the quarterback, he's kind of running like a curve behind the quarterback, almost like you see in the CFL or whatever. Mm-hmm. But you're, seeing, you're seeing it more and more in high school football. And, uh, you know, they're, they're, if Rochester gets aggressive, then they're going to call some screen passes on you. So let's see how the Rochester defense adapts. Yeah. But uh, in terms of, I think, you know, the Rochester defense is much improved this year from a year ago. I mean, they, they just struggled to keep up last year speed-wise against teams like Valley and Northfield, and they're mu- uh, unfortunately, we, uh, obviously we want to see how they compare against a team like Valley, but definitely speed-wise they compare much better uh, to their competition. So the uh, Zebras on the road at North Miami this week, then they finish off the season at home against Conoqua. So a couple of uh, uh, Miami County teams uh, for the Zebras, and then we'll find out obviously on Sunday you know, who they will be playing and where they'll be playing uh, come sectional time in the uh, following week. Uh, for Tippecanoe Valley, they continue to roll, putting up 57 points against McConaughey. Um, 
you know, we kind of thought they would have uh, an advantage against McConaughey, but did you see that coming? Fifty-seven points. Uh, I think I thought they would. Sc- I'm less surprised by the fifty-seven than I am by the six. Yeah. I thought McConaughey would be able to score some points. That their their passing game has just been so explosive, but Valley shut them down. McConaughey's only touchdown came on the last play of the game on a twenty-five yard touchdown pass against Valley's JV with a running clock going. That's the only. Th- that's the first defensive touchdown Valley's allowed in four games. I mean, this Valley defense has been hard to move the ball on. Valley's ranked in the top 15 in the state. I, I, I tweeted about this early in the week. Valley's in the top 15 in the state in both offensive scoring average and defensive scoring average. Hmm. That's impressive. The only Valley's one of only three schools in the state that are in the top 15 in both. I think Adams Central and Eastbrook are the other two. Yeah, yeah. And at, when you talk... Adam Central and Eastbrook are synonymous with football, so I mean, oh, yeah. you know, they're good every year. So, I mean, Valley has just been playing at, a, at just a very high level, and you know, Braden Shepard just every which way, running, receiving, kick return, punt return, he is a threat to take the ball the distance every time he touches the ball. You know, Jamison Virgil, again, I think had a couple more touchdown runs. I mean, th- this offense has been just moving the ball, just with ease. I mean, just at will on their opponents, and I mean. When Branson McBride throws an incomplete pass, it stopped the presses. I mean, six for eight last week. I mean, it's it's that way every game. Six for eight, seven for nine, eight for nine. I mean, just a very, very efficient passer. Yeah. They're averaging 42, 43 a game? Uh, 44, 44, yeah. 44, yeah. yeah. So well over 40 points a game. They're 7 and 0, 5 and 0 in and, conference. And allowing only six. 7 and 0 for the first time since 87? 1987, yeah. yeah which was. That was the year that Rochester won state. Right. But that remember Rochester lost to Valley that year. Right. Very very good Valley team that year. Yeah. Yeah. Know. So that was. Yeah. I mean, uh, the first time since I think Jeff Phillips was the coach in uh, Valley in '87. It's the seventh time in school history. Remember from like from from a, an eleven year span from '77 to '87, they started seven and six times, and that was you know Charlie Smith was behind coached most of the most of those teams so. Yeah, this is rare air for Valley football. This is this is something. Of course, a lot of those times Valley didn't start seven and O's because they usually would play either Warsaw or North Judson in the season opener, mm-hmm. and they ran into some very good Valley Warsaw teams and some very very good North Judson teams. But yeah, and some of course some very very good CMA teams. Right, in later as of years. late, yeah, they've been hitting yeah. CMA at the beginning of the year. So yeah, but uh, I mean, it's it's just it's not you know the thing about Valley. I mean, you say well if he. You know, we're going to shut down Shepard. Well, good luck with that. But even if you do, are you going to stop the other guys? Are you going to stop Virgil? Are you going to stop Aaronman? Are you going to stop Kirkenstein? I mean, he. I mean, he's been coming on of late. Are you going to stop their? And are you going to be able to score points on their defense? So, yeah, this has just been a complete team. I wanted to give. Hopefully, those McConaughey kids are doing okay. The one kid looked like he broke his leg. I actually saw a picture of it. It was. Yeah, you don't. You don't need to see it. It was yeah. pretty ugly. And apparently he had to be taken by ambulance to the hospital, and then another kid suffered a concussion, and so they had to wait for that ambulance to come back to the field, and so that's why it took so long to complete the first half. Apparently both teams got sent back to the locker room. Yeah. So to... That think, was a, a later yeah, finish to that game. Yeah, Co- I talked with Coach Stephen Moriarty. He said we had to warm up four times. Wow. Because of all the injuries, so... Yeah. Hopefully those two McConaughey kids are doing okay, but... Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, Braxton Burner, McConaughey's quarterback, threw 42 passes in that game. And that's not the first time he's thrown 40-plus passes in a game either. I mean, this is, I mean, they spread it out, and they will, they, I mean, in a lot of different kind of route combinations, they're not afraid to throw, you know, short passes, intermediate passes, deep passes. It's, it's, a, it's a true run-and-shoot offense. Yeah, and that number may not sound that great if you, you know, you're used to listening to or watching NFL football, but... There's a lot of teams in, in high school that don't throw that many passes in a season. Yeah. Ten passes in a quarter, in a 12-minute quarter? Yeah, yeah. That's a lot. That's, that's a ton. Mm-hmm. So Now Valley goes to Wabash this week, another road game, and another team with a quarterback who will be in shotgun. And will, I, mean, I imagine they'll want to try to throw the ball a lot. Uh, Isaac Wright has really been impressive. He has gotten better and better as the season's gone on. Uh, but, again, I don't, I'm not sure he has faced a defense as good as Valley's. Well, and uh, another turf field for them, so they're going to be fast. And, you know, obviously Wabash is struggling 1-5, 1-3 in the conference. So 
could be another high scoring night for Valley. And does that mean who will Valley put on Antonio Grant Wabash's star receiver? Will it be Rex Kirkenstein or Braden Shepard? And if Valley's done a good job of shutting down top receivers so far this year. Well, you have those two options right there. I mean, that's uh, that's pretty good, uh, mm -hmm. you know, defensive combination right mm -hmm. there. So, so Valley at Wabash tonight. A Pioneer um, hosted Knox last week at uh, Pioneer's homecoming. After starting 0 and 2, the Panthers now setting at 5 and 2, 4 and 1 in conference. Took care of the Knox Redskins 34-14. You know, Knox 1-6 overall, 0-4 in conference, um, not having the greatest season, but still it's a 3A opponent. And, you know, Pioneer really, after that slow start, got some guys healthy, came back. You know, defense has never been an issue for them all mm -hmm. season, but their offense is rolling. Coach Barry is, has kind of changed some things around. And, uh, you know, a lineman yeah. went to tight end, and now he's quarterback. Yeah, you know, he's what this is, what his sixth year as coach, mm -hmm. and he's lost seven games. Yeah, I think there's kind of something to that. He might have, uh, he might have something figured out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, he's humble. I don't know if you'd ever say he's figured it out, but I mean, they, they, they know how to make adjustments and they know their personnel. And you know, they switched to Caleb Sweet, and I think, I think the, the film speaks for itself. I think the ball, the offense moved. He's their fourth different starting quarterback this year. You know, with Caden Hill, Eli Nickel, Brock Robinson, and now Sweet. I think the ball moved, the, the offense moved the ball as well as they had all season in his first start. I know um, he had been up quarantined earlier in the year, so in terms of using him as a quarterback, I think Coach Barry was a little reluctant to, to go there. And when they had, you know, Brock, when he became available, it seemed like a good op option, but, uh, you know, out of the shotgun. But now with, with Caleb Sweet, I think he's added an extra dimension. The passing game is really moving well. And on top of that, Bo Mersch has been incredible. Four mm -hmm. carries for 144 yards last week. That's 36 yards a carry. It's not a bad average. Not, not a bad <laughs> average. And so you know uh, that you're going to get that counter coming at you with Bo a couple, three times a game, you know, three, four, five times a game. And, boy, that gives their offense a, a more explosive dimension. And now Brock Robinson can go back to that fullback position that he's comfortable playing. Yeah, it seems like Coach Barry has really gotten that uh, side of the ball figured out. Like we said, the the defensive side never really an issue. And yeah, uh, Derek Legrand, he, he has been just very very good. I mean, he is just so hard to block, and he sets the edge on that defensive end spot. And then Oscar Solano has been great. And you know the 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 slanting the slanting defense that they play is just so unique. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, with the way they de slant the defensive linemen. And we talk about Caleb Sweet as a quarterback. He's a heck of a linebacker, too. Yeah. Great on both sides of the ball. Yeah. Yeah. So they're going to be at Culver this week. Culver coming off of a win. They won 22-14 at Caston last week. Uh, we're going to have that. I'm actually going to be up there this week since we're not going to North Miami. Um, talk about the Cavaliers. You know, we, we've seen a couple of games. Uh, the biggest thing, I think, that's holding them back uh, you know, from winning a couple of those games, that Triton game, uh, the turnover bug has been kind of their nemesis. And finally they flipped it on its head against Caston. Mm -hmm. Caston had three turnovers last week, and Culver had zero turnovers. And they finally just flipped it on its head, and that's why they won the game, 22-14. to 14. Shane Schumann, another big game. And I think they, had, I think Culver had like a 13-minute drive in the second half. <laughs> they, they held onto the ball for more than a full quarter, and they drove 99 yards for a touchdown. Mm-hmm. And that would just, when you do that, you just take the life out of your opponent. I mean, it was, it's, it was interesting watching the tape. Sam Smith from Caston was everywhere. He had 17 tackles, but it was, it was almost a bad thing. From a, as good as he was, it was almost a bad thing from a Caston standpoint because he needed to, to play more offense. But mm. they just couldn't get Culver off the field. Culver converted a couple fourth downs, and that was the key. Schumann was great. Jason Cato had a big touchdown run. Um, you know, Caston, it wasn't that Caston wasn't able to move the ball. They just didn't have the ball, they just didn't have enough possession time when they, to make, to take advantage of it. I mean, so yeah, a good win for Culver, a good confidence booster to win on the road against a Caston team that was really competing hard. And yeah, uh, Culver really needs that going into to face Pioneer. I talked with Mike Zane earlier in this week and I asked him about Pioneer and he said, they're still, the, they're still fast. Mm -hmm. He goes, yeah, the Llewellyn brother, you know, the, the Llewellyn brothers have graduated, but still, you watch them on film, and they're just the fastest team, mm -hmm. maybe in the conference. And he, you know, he said, boy, that yeah, they lost to Winnemac, but that's not the, 
the pioneer team that we're going to be playing on Friday night. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And you know that was the thing with the game last year with Culver and Pioneer. The Cavs, I, I think it was over two to one as far as time of possession, but Pioneer still won that game big because you know Pioneer has that quick hitting ability. Obviously, you talk about you know Ezra and Adai last year, mm -hmm. but. Uh, they seem to have found that uh, combination a little bit this year. So uh, Culver's going to have to uh, definitely hold on to the ball. Mm -hmm. uh, they're going to have to find a way to stop this new high-powered Pioneer offense right. if they want to compete with them. Right, and from Culver's standpoint, defensively, as they prepare for this game, it's how, how do you use Shane Schumann? Because you think of Shane as a fullback, but he's also an all-state linebacker. Mm -hmm. Are you going to use him as kind of a blitzer? Kind of have him hovering over the offensive line, and okay, where's he coming from? Is he going to blitz? Is he going to where's he, where's he going to blitz from? Mm -hmm. Or do you maybe have him, you know, read and react a little bit more? So, because so, I mean, he's obviously the guy you've got you've got to account for from Pioneer standpoint at just about every play. Mm -hmm. And then you know, uh, the, the, you know, Tucker Fisher is a really good linebacker too. He's going to have to have a big game in terms of tackling, and you you can't of course you can't miss tackles against Pioneer. Right. As for the pioneer defense, I mean, they you know they've had they've had good success stopping the the, the power T, so, uh, yeah, well, I, I'm curious to see if pioneer can keep up this this defensive streak that they've been on. I know Knox scored 14, but one of those touchdowns was two minutes to go in the game, and it was basically over at that point. Yeah, so that'll be an interesting game. We'll have that one for you. For Caston coming off of the loss to Culver, it's not going to get any easier for the comments as they go. Uh, to Winnemac this week, and that's a Winnemac team, obviously, that has been perfect this year, five and zero. Yeah, and I talked with Coach Will Porter, and he talked about you know they're ex talking about Winnemac's experience, and um, he, you know he really was impressed by you know watching Russell Compton on film as he prepares for this game. Uh, again, Sam Smith, seventeen tackles last week. You know, Grant Hickel, Landon Schaefer, Garrison Hickel, they've all been playing pretty well on defense, but they couldn't get any takeaways, and so the time of possession went against them. You know, Coach Will Porter said he was very uh, pleased with his team's competitiveness. He said, we, you know, even against a physical team like Culver, we hung in there for four quarters. And so that's two weeks in a row now where they played really good defense against North White and Culver, mm -hmm. but Winnemac's a step up defensively mm -hmm. yeah, as, a, as, a, or as a challenge for Caston's defense. Right, their offense is uh, pretty high-powered. Right, I mean, Ka again, Caston's two wins are their two non-conference games. Right, right. So if, they, if Caston can get a, boy, a non-conference game on win on the road boy that would mean so much to them but boy it's it's been an uphill climb it would be an uphill climb i think uh, winnemac has beaten cast in six years in a row yeah so winnemac looking to get some momentum as they go into week uh nine you know that big matchup with uh uh judson right no no it's winnemac's judson. week nine game is against triton triton judson Pioneer's is going week nine to game is against right. North judson so uh yeah so they're wanting to get some momentum a couple of conference games to finish the year off and possibly seeing Judson in sectional. So we'll find out where they go, you know, this Sunday. Right. Uh, you know, I talked with John Hendricks earlier in the week. Um, penalties were a little bit of a problem. Seven penalties uh, against West Central last week. Two turnovers. Not good. So I'd like to just cut down on the mistakes. Still mm -hmm. in Winnemac, 135 to nothing. It's back-to-back -back shutouts for Winnemac. They also shut out Culver the previous week. So it's first time back-to-back -back shutouts since 2014. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we'll see if they can keep that up. Um, you know, that, that was obviously a really good Winnemac team in 2014. Lost a pioneer in the region when the sectional lost a pioneer in the regional. So yeah, uh, this is a you know a Winnemac team with high hopes and uh, obviously just just very very uh, experienced and obviously you know that you know this uh, the cast and option offense is just something unique and you know talking with John Henderson, he said you know first is that midline you have to deal with the midline and you have to deal with at least the threat of them handing the ball to Sam Smith. Mm -hmm. And then, um, you know, Schaefer's at, you know, Landon Schaefer's had a little bit more of a passing dimension to their offense, so Winnemac will have to be wary of that as well. As opposed to, you know, playing teams like Culver and West Central, which were run heavy, so maybe some of the DBs could kind of creep up on the line a little bit. Well, you, that might not be as, it might not be as simple as that this week, even, okay. even though they're facing an option right. the offense. Uh, Hoosier North Conference standings. Judson stands at the top, 4-0. Winnemac, 3-0. Uh, Pioneer and LaVille flip-flop. Pioneer goes to 4-1. and one. LaVille is at 3-1. and one. Triton, 2-3. and three. And then Culver uh, picked up that big conference win their first of the year. They're 1-3. and three. Knox, 0-4. Caston, 0-5. and 5. 
For uh, the TRC, Valley still setting atop the conference at 5-0. and oh. Northfield right there behind them at 5-1. and one. Peru at 4-1. and one. Uh, McConaughey at 3-2. and two. Then Rochester uh, right there in the middle of the pack stays at uh, 500 at 2-2. Two and two. Southwood, um, you know, after a, a hot start, they've dropped down their 3-3. Three and three. Southwood's quarterback, Mo Lloyd, is injured right now. And uh, uh, they did not have him last week, and they lost to Peru. Pretty good Peru team, so yeah. they're hopeful to get Mo back as they get ready for the 1A state tournament. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, as you go down the list, you know, uh, Wabash and Whitco both with one win, and then Miami, North Miami at 0 and 6. So Valley gave uh, Northfield their only conference loss, and they gave Peru their only conference loss. Again, I don't know if, if they're going to be reluctant to crown anybody a conference champion, but. If Valley runs the table, I'd have no trouble giving Valley a trophy. Yeah, yeah. Given that they've, every, and everybody else has two losses at least, so if, if Valley runs the table, I'd have no trouble giving Valley a trophy. Yeah. Well, um, any other football you want to talk about? Not really. I mean, just I, I haven't heard of a canceled game this week. Good, yes. And, uh, just by mentioning that, I might be jinxing ourselves, but yeah. I haven't heard about any team in the northern half of the state having to cancel a game, so yeah. hopefully that means cases are going down and people are being safe. Yeah, Either that or we're just getting lucky. Yeah. But whatever, I'm happy. I know, I know a, lot of, a lot of schools have gone back to wearing the masks, and I think that's cut down on the contact tracing that they've had to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I, I, one of the things that I heard today was uh, for Rochester's game, uh, volleyball game against Whitco uh, Thursday night, they're going to allow full attendance, but you got to wear a mask. So, you know, it's a little bit of a trade off. If you want to go, you can go, but you got to wear a mask. Mm-hmm. So, you know, if that keeps things going, then I guess we, we throw them on for a little while and, you know, hopefully we can get back through this here as we move into, you know, the indoor seasons coming up. So, Looking forward to the draw coming up on uh, Sunday, 5 o'clock. Right. Um, obviously, we'll have our eyes on Class 2A, Sectional 34, and that's the sectional that Pioneer and Rochester are in. Again, you can throw a blanket over those teams. You know, Pioneer, Rochester, LaVille, Bremen. Mm-hmm. Look like they'll all be, Manchester look like they'll all be in the mix. I think Delphi, Lewis, Cass, and Wabash might be on the underdog side of things, but even those teams are kind of dangerous. Sure, sure. It's, and uh, those teams are pretty capable. Yeah, like you said, it's, it's kind of wide open. I mean, there's there's a couple there that probably have a little advantage, but if you get the right team at the right uh, location on the right night, you know, I think any one of those teams in that con- in that sectional can win. Right, I, I mean, I think you could look at it and say that Lewis Cass has maybe played as tough a schedule as anybody. Yeah. Or Bremen. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, uh, yeah, it, I mean... It doesn't always happen that way. In fact, it rarely happens that way. It's mm-hmm. where you can have a pretty tightly contested sectional where every game is going to be pretty competitive. So I'm looking forward to that. You know, it would be really fun. We, you know, last year was the first year that Pioneer got moved into that sectional, mm-hmm. and we didn't get to see a Rochester Pioneer game. Mm-hmm. So I, I think that would be fun from a yeah. RTC standpoint with two of our schools playing. That would be a, a lot of fun to to see that and see how they match up. As for Valley, they moved up in the polls from number 8 to number 7 mm-hmm. in Class 3A, but the computer polls don't really like them as much mm-hmm. as the human polls do. Uh, we'll see uh, when a possible valley mishawaka Marion matchup would be. Will they draw each other right off the bat, or will, it, will they have to wait to face them? Uh-huh. mishawaka Marion has dominated the sectional over the years, and the computer polls seem to like the Knights quite a bit. Yeah. Uh, I don't think there's much doubt that Mishawaka Marion's played a tougher schedule than Valley has. Right. We'll see what that would mean if they do potentially meet. Yeah. And of course, Jimtown, they, you know, they've been, you know, I think the, the issue with Jimtown in recent years has been, yeah, their defense is good, but they struggle to score points. Well, they're not, they haven't been struggling to score points this year. They are explosive. And their defense has been good. So uh, the Jimmies, they might be laying in the weeds here, but. They will be formidable if you wind up having to play them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, if you're a Valley fan, you want Mishawaka Marion to draw Jimtown. Yeah. Well, and you got to look at the both of those teams probably have tougher schedules than yeah. Valley does. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, we'll see. That's it's going to be interesting. Five o'clock on Sunday for the uh, football draw to see who plays where. Uh, and in, coming up, yeah, and one yeah. A obviously we're expecting you know one 
when will Win when will Winnemac and North Judson meet? Right. Will they draw each other right off the bat, or would they would they have to wait to meet right. because they didn't play during the regular season? So it's kind of kind of leave the Hoosier North kind of unresolved at the end, uh, mm -hmm. maybe. But again, Winnemac and North Judson have played every year. Winnemac has had a varsity football team since yeah. 1970. Yeah. And that, that definitely seems to be uh, a Winnemac Judson sectional and then everybody else. It would seem to be. I think yeah. Coach Zayner, uh, I talked with him. He said, after right at, I talked to him right on the field after they lost at Winnemac a couple weeks ago. He said, I think we're going to play this team again on the sectional. So mm -hmm. I think he wants, them to, he wants them to believe. Yeah. So, yeah. But that, that would seem to, that would, what the, the power rank, the computer rankings seem to think that. Yeah. Mm hmm. I mean, Lake Station has really struggled this year. South Newton is a little bit better. They won a couple games this year, mm -hmm. but uh, I don't know if they'd be. I, I, I'd be surprised if they'd be able to hang with a senior-dominated uh, Winnemac team, for sure. example. Sure. Sure. And then you know West Central. I think they've been struggling a little bit numbers wise. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, well, it uh, yeah. South, South Central is around five hundred. Yeah. Yeah. It'll be interesting to see what happens there Sunday at 5 IHSA TV for the football sectional draw. We're going to take a break. We'll come back. We'll talk some uh, soccer and some volleyball in our next segment here on Talking Sports with Val. Thanks for tuning in. In your true value has everything you need to get your next project done. Located on Main Street in Rochester, In your true value has the product to get the job done. From tools and supplies to kitchen appliances, Inyard's True Value has got you covered. Call 574-223-4920 or visit www.truevaluecompany.com. The innocence of youth. Is there anything any better? But soon they'll be in high school and facing all the same challenges you faced. How to make friends. How to fit in how to be cool. We want our children to have everything they'll need to live fulfilling and productive lives. Make sure the kids in your family are among the more than 160,000 participants here in Indiana who take part in high school sports. At First Federal Savings Bank, we offer a wide selection of valuable services for our customers. We offer a variety of deposit products, such as personal and business accounts. We pride ourselves in being one of the top mortgage lenders in Indiana. At First Federal Savings Bank, we offer business loans and business checking accounts. Give us a call at any one of our branch locations and let us help you. Through LPL Financial, our financial services department is here to help you with your financial planning needs. Come see us today and see how our family can help your family. Hi, welcome back here talking sports with Val for a Friday evening. And uh, Val, uh, let's start off with soccer because you've, uh, like you said, you made two trips to Fort Wayne this week. Uh, one trip didn't end so well. The I mean, neither one really, I guess, ended well for the teams because they, both our teams got eliminated. But you got to look at the the game on Wednesday night. Uh, Argus took Fort Wayne Canterbury to PKs. I mean. Uh, the number one team in Class 2A. How impressive were the Argus Dragons going down the stretch? They knocked off the Academy. They knocked off Bethany Christian. One conference again. I mean, that's yeah. a tough conference. They set that conference up just for soccer. Northern mm -hmm. A.S. Soccer Conference. Yeah. And then they took uh, they took Canterbury on their home field all the way to PKs. Yeah, you know, I was talking with Todd Vanderweel after the game against Canterbury, and he goes, "Boy, you wanna, you wanna end your season playing your best game of the season." Mm -hmm. And he goes, "Whether that's the state championship game or just a sectional game," and I, he goes, "I think we did." And I would agree, boy. That it was just, you know, you think, well, it was zero zero through regulation and zero zero through two overtimes. That might sound boring. It was not boring. Mm -hmm. It was it was edge of your seat stuff the whole night and. You know, I mean, boy, I have so much respect for Caden Brady and, and Dylan Kendig because those are those center backs in Argus's defense, and boy, were they busy all night. I mean, Canterbury comes out at you, and they are fast. Mm -hmm. And they move it fast, and they, they stretch the width of the field. I mean, you have to cover the whole field against them. And Caden and Dylan, I mean, they positive touches every time they touch the ball. And then you, you look at Nate Manikowski. Boy, has he, has he grown up. I mean, he has been playing so much better, but boy, you know, they had 
you know, Fort Wayne Canberra had this kid, uh, Kamarska. He was our leading goal scorer at 13 goals. And, you know, it's funny. In another school, he would have been like a fullback on the football team. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was fast and broad-shouldered. And, I mean, I mean, he kids, opposing players just bounced off him, you know. I mean, he and when he got ahead of steam going, he was hard to stop. But, boy, I mean... I mean, they just they, they stopped him every time. I mean, they did just a. It was a great. It was just a great defensive performance. Valley Argus's opportunities were kind of few and far between. Ethan Pets had a great shot, but um, on, a, on kind of a counterattack. But their uh, Borwin Canterbury's keeper uh, Saad Alabtawi made the stop, and he he is the best goalkeeper I've seen this year. Um, Coach Vanderweel called him Division One caliber after it was over. I talked with Greg Mount, the Fort Wayne Canterbury coach. Yeah, he said, yeah, he's Division One caliber, all right. And I mean, he's you know like six two. I mean, he can like touch the net without jumping, touch mm -hmm. the top of the net without jumping. So he he really could cover the hole with the with the net. But boy, the, Argus is, you know, I, I I was just so impressed with Argus's defense because boy, the, I mean. Canterbury just pressures you and pressures you and pressures you. I think the sh shots on goal are something like 12 to 5. Mm -hmm. But I already said a few good counterattacks. You know, Michael Richard had to play back most of the game. I mean, this is not, you know, Teddy Redinger had to play back most of the game and, and just help just help out with the defensive effort. But I thought they, they, I thought they played really good as well. Um, Vladimir Bernard, he was just so fun to watch. I mean, he's another guy who had, you know, maybe more of like a midfielder, kind of more of an attacking type player, but he had to play back. Uh, they left their hearts out on the field, but it came down to PKs, and Canterbury won 4-2 to in the PK round after, you know, zero goals by either team through uh, 80 minutes plus 14 minutes of overtimes. So after no goals of 90, after 94 minutes, you know, they won 4-2. to uh, You know, again, penalty kicks are so random. Mm -hmm. It's just hard to know. I mean, I everybody practices them. Um, you know, Coach Vanderweel said that he decided to leave Teddy Redinger out of the PKs because Teddy had been 0 for 2 on the season. Uh, just tough. And it was funny, Olive Tawi, their goalie, he took the the last penalty kick. He he had the clincher. Really? Yeah. That, that, you don't see that very often. Right. We're like, because I was like, what wait, what the heck's he doing? I'm roam not in the middle of the field. I was like. Oh no, he's taking the penalty kick. Yeah, I don't think I've ever seen that actually. Yeah, come to think of it, yeah. where a, an opposing goalie takes a PK. Right, and Kamerska, who's their leading goal scorer, he didn't take a PK either. Hmm. So, boy, and you think, boy, if if he can stop him, then Michael Richard gets the last kick, and Michael is clutch as clutch could be. Mm -hmm. Maybe if he makes it, it's three three, and you're going to extra extra penalty kicks. Right. But yeah. Alab Tawi nailed it. Yeah, they made four out of their five. Four and, to and five, and Argus made two out of their four. Right, didn't get the fifth one. Yeah. So it kind of has, to me, thinking back to the classic uh, sectional rivalries in the early 2000s with Pioneer and LCC in football. Mm -hmm. It kind of has that feel to it, you know, public school versus private school. Both, you know, and they, they always would meet in sectional mm -hmm. play. Does this kind of feel like that was a kind of de facto Northern Championship? Do you think anybody's going to stop Canterbury? Well, the Concordia would like to have something to say about that. Concordia beat Caller Academy one to nothing on Thursday night, so we got the number one and number four teams in the state meeting in a sectional final. Mm -hmm. They played to a tie earlier this year, one one. Okay. So we'll see. Uh, Canterbury has allowed six goals all season. Concordia has allowed ten goals all season, so that one has <laughs> another one has, uh, overtime potential. Yeah, zero yeah. zero and PKs to decide it. Yeah, I mean, boy, that, but again, uh, just the edge of your seat nature of that game. Commerce could take a shot from about within the like the last, I think it was like thirty seconds to go in the second overtime from about thirty five yards out, and it was a bullet, and it hit the top of the post and then bounced straight down. Mm. It went bang bang. Yeah. even some of the Canterbury. Kids thought it went bang and then went over the goal line, mm -hmm. but the the assistant ref was like he shook his head no he he looked like he had a pretty good look at it so, mm -hmm. I mean it was that kind of edge of your seat action all night it was a heck of a game it was a heck of a game I I'd even you know you look at Argus losing to Providence and in, in last year's state championship game I 
that was a heck of a game too. But I, I would say Argus even put it more out on the line in this game. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because uh, you know I was up in Argus getting ready for girls sectional earlier today, and talking to Andy Stone, he said the prediction uh, earlier in the week was five zero. You know, for Canterbury. So I mean, good gravy. That's. Yeah, boy, Canterbury, they they are talented. I mean, that Donovan Doolittle, their center mid, I mean, he is a wizard with the ball. Um, he had to leave. It looked like he cramped, kind of cramped up kind of late in the game, and that helped out a little bit because he, I mean, you just don't know where he's going with the ball. They, they're impressive, but, boy, Argus was just right there. I mean, mm -hmm. they were right there. I mean, Aiden Mills, what a player he's become. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it, it was fun to see those guys develop, and even the just disappointing Argus was coming off a six nothing win over Valley on Monday. That was my first trip to Fort Wayne earlier in the week, and you yeah. know Ar Argus looked sharp in that game, and you kind of wondered, can this team give Canterbury a, a challenge? It was well, they they gave them everything they would want, yeah. I'm sure, and yeah, probably it, some more. And it, you know, it's a classic game. I think of two school Ar the Argus Canterbury game was kind of a classic case of two schools that don't play football, and so their best athletes are playing soccer. Right. I think Argus was more physical than Valley, and that allowed him to win those 50-50 balls. Now you play a Canterbury team that's also very physical, mm -hmm. and so how do you win those 50-50 balls? It's tough. Yeah. I talked with Coach uh, Greg Mock. He he was he was very uh, complimentary of Argus. He goes, you know, we've been hey, we know about Argus. Like, mm -hmm. oh yeah. yeah, you know, we. We've been, he's been there for I think thirty five years or so. He was oh, a, wow. He's won seven state championships as a coach. He's a, he's if he's not the greatest high school soccer coach in Indiana state history, I don't know who. It, he, he's certainly in the conversation. I right. know coach down in Evansville has well, done great too. But I mean, he said, yeah, we we've been you know we played them back in the day when uh, Tim Van Dyne was the coach, so we know about their history and tradition. So mm -hmm. he, they were, he was very respectful, and they said, you know, we had to, you know, our, our defense kind of held up. We you know we, we didn't. You know, they didn't get many sh chances inside the box, and we kept an eye on Teddy Redinger. Yeah. So it's quite a compliment that Coach Mock would talk about Teddy Redinger. Right. That they knew to prepare for him. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, the, the Dragon season comes to a close, but they uh, they definitely gave it everything they had. And as you said, uh, Rochester earlier in the week, they lost to Concordia. Um, you know, some ties there as well, you know, obviously with, uh, with uh, Coach Roke. Uh, down there in Rochester mm -hmm. now, and you know they had a great season. Um, just ran into a brutal sectional. Yeah, and just ran into a Concordia team that was yeah just had a lot more I think depth than Rochester did. Uh, you know I think the whole year was kind of a learning experience for Coach Roke and for the players. Unfortunately, Zach Pickens graduates. He's one of the best players in the conference, so they're gonna have to. Um, see where the program goes from there. But, I mean, the, the, yeah, there were some young, talented players, but um, we'll have to maybe pick up the slack moving forward. But, uh, yeah, that was a Concordia team that was ready to go, a team that's been ranked in the top five in the state all year, and they didn't want to fall behind early, and that's exactly what happened. Yeah. The, so Pickens graduates. He is the all-time leader in Rochester history for goals scored. So both in a season and in a career. Right. right. Yeah. So broke, broke Will Tone's records. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's going to be hard. It's going to be big shoes to fill. We uh you know, wish Zach well. I mean, it's just been fun to watch him the last few years. Yeah. He's, he's been something pretty special. And, yeah, a, a fun kid too. Yeah. Really really, you know, smart articulate kid who really uh he really gets it. Looking looking forward to spring watching him run track because uh you know, I kind of really got more into track and field last year obviously with with you being here and, mm -hmm. and your coverage of it and listening to the stories about you know how he runs it's yeah looking forward to that senior year yeah yeah so there's some track records he's already set some soccer records and there's some track records that might be in jeopardy yeah yeah um uh, so while we're talking soccer mm -hmm. the rochester uh lady zebras unfortunately uh their comeback attempt you know it was kind of uh fun because I was watching your tweets as I was doing the Valley Rochester uh, volleyball game and at one point I looked down it was 4-1 uh, in favor of Culver and it wasn't a few minutes later I looked down and it was 4-3 mm -hmm. uh, so you know Rochester made a, a valiant comeback effort uh, but uh, unfortunately it fell a little short. So many momentum twists and turns in that game I mean Culver was up you know I mean they scored a goal 31 seconds into the game it was 1-0 Culver right then and there. Then they added another goal. Two, it was 2-0, and you're like, how is, it, how is this 2-0? Uh, 
I mean, Rochester had something like six shots on goal. Culver had two, but both the Culvers wound up in the back of the net. And I think for the game, it was something like 15-6. to six. Mm-hmm. And it was 11-0 to zero in corner kicks. Mm-hmm. Kind of indicative of the same yeah. style, the same thing that happened during yeah. the regular Rochester season. Rochester had 11 up. corner kicks and Culver had none. Mm-hmm. I mean, how often do you win that game if you're out? I mean, I know corner kicks are just part of the game, and it, but it, it kind of indicates about how much... I don't know, to me, corner kicks is kind of a good indicator of possession time and how mm-hmm. much are you spending in your opponent's half of the field. And mm-hmm. But Culver was just so opportunistic. They were good at finishing, and Rochester wasn't. And mm-hmm. I talked with Coach Chantel Rensberger of Rochester after the game, and she said, we kicked it right to their goalie a lot. Mm-hmm. They had that same problem during during the regular season matchup. They yeah. they out you know out had outnumbered them in uh, shots on goal, but they just you know couldn't get them to go through. Yeah. And Giselle Villegas had those two beautiful assists in the first half to the freshman, Banks. Uh, Cassidy Banks is the freshman. And her older sister, Mackenzie, scored in a penalty kick in the second half. You know, Kaylee Hamilton, you know, she and Giselle Villegas are the two leaders on this team. Um, and they're, they're just confident. I mean, they, they believe they're going to they believe they're gonna win these games. Culver is 14-3. and three. Mm-hmm. I mean, this is no this team is no fluke. Mm-hmm. And even Coach Chantal Rensberg said, "Hey, I mean, we, we give all credit to Culver. I mean, we they they outplayed us, mm-hmm. but at the same time, you can't help but and and, and you know Chantal Rensberg said, hey, we you know we, we had a year when I was in high school, we were thirteen and zero, and then lost in the sectional. I mean, we know, of course, that was in the single class days, but right. I mean, we we get her point that you know, er, you know, when it's a one and done state tournament and everybody starts zero and zero, it's yeah, unpredictable things can happen." Well, and but remember Culver beat Rochester during the regular season. It's, mm-hmm. but it, yeah, but that was similar too. Rochester had more shots and seemingly more opportunities in that game as well. Yeah. And in both games, Rochester missed two PKs. Mm-hmm. They missed Sophie Heath had two saves on PKs in the regular season game. Rochester missed two PKs in this game, but both of them the goalie didn't have to touch. One hit the post, and the other was just wide left. Mm. Yeah, that's. Uh... Two two shots that they wish they could have had. Yeah, and, and and you also feel terrible. I mean, for Haley Pesic of Rochester, she missed the game, torn ACL. She was trying to play in the torn ACL, but apparently the doc said no. The, she's it, it's apparently it was worse than just the ACL. I mean, there might have been some MCL damage as well, and oh. it's going to require reconstructive surgery. And so the the doctor just said no, she can't play. And again, she she might have made a difference because she had one of the strongest legs on the team. Mm-hmm. Well, for Coach Rensberger, obviously, you know, a great season. TRC champions. Uh, they've got a lot of uh, yeah. kids coming back for next year. I mean, they're, they're obviously losing some as well. I think George is a senior. Kaylee Woods, yeah. Becky Leslie. Yeah. They, so they're they're losing, it, but they've got some some nice young talent to come back with. It's like a nice e- even distribution of players at every grade level, seemingly. Yeah. And that's what you, what's what. What's kind of attractive about this team? It's just seemingly that that allow you to reload so much. They, they, it doesn't seem like there'll be a rebuilding year anytime soon. Right, right. So, yeah, you know, you got to look at like Emma Hadishell. You know, coming yeah. in hasn't played for a long time, and and she really had a great year and such a single season back. record for goals scored. Yeah. And you know, Callie Watson got some very meaningful playing time. She was another newcomer to the team. Boy, Macy, and then you had you know Amy Williams running on the left flank and Macy Nelson running on the right flank, and both of those girls are dangerous. So how do you defend a team that can kind of stretch the field on you? And then you know Lily Eaton, boy, she took such a big step forward, and she's only a sophomore. Mm-hmm. She took a big step forward from freshman to sophomore, and to have her and Kendall Bradley just re- that's all kinds of speed in the middle of the field. Mm-hmm. I mean Rochester just they're just a more athletic team. This is yeah. the most ath- athletic team that Coach Rensberg is having. The most athletic, just Rochester girls soccer team, period, I, I would mm-hmm. argue. Mm-hmm. A really athletic group of kids. I mean, we're going to see them here in a few weeks yeah. on the basketball floor. Yeah. A lot of those same names. Yeah, you know. I mean, just, and again, that, that athleticism really shows up with those, those 50-50 balls. Mm-hmm. And you're able to just, you know, kind of out-muscle your opponent for the ball. Yeah. So for the Cavaliers winning. Kennedy Jackson, too. I want to give Kennedy a shout-out. She's yeah. really been, She really played well in that yeah. line. Yeah, yeah. And she hasn't played for a while. I don't think she played last year, right? No, she did. I think yeah. she, yeah, no, yeah, she didn't so, play last yeah. year. I, I I noticed that on that defensive. Uh, you know, she's a solid defender for them. Mm-hmm. So, uh, for the Cavaliers, they won. Uh, they're going to be taking on uh, Argus, who defeated Bremen uh, in the semifinal round on Thursday night. So this will be already done. Uh, any chance? I mean, obviously Argus. You know, they're coming off of a semi-state appearance last year. 
realistically, as good of a season as Culver's had is, is yeah. It's too bad that these teams don't meet during the regular season. So right, they used to. They used to, mm-hmm. yeah. It, it, it's not a. There's not. It's not like they're feuding or anything. It's mm-hmm. just. A, it was just a scheduling thing that they couldn't well, find, I, find a date to play. I think when Culver didn't have a team there for a few years, I think Argus just filled their schedule that, up. That's basically yeah. what happened. Yeah, yeah, when Culver didn't have a team, uh, again, it's gonna. It's gonna come down to finishing. Mm-hmm. I mean, Culver is a very efficient finishing team, and Argus has frankly struggled a little bit at it. Mm-hmm. Or at least they've been up. They've been inconsistent at it. Uh, mm-hmm. During that mid part of the season, they were really good at it, but toward the end of the season, they struggled a little bit. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think they may have struggled a little bit against Bremen. I mean, they won two to nothing, but one of the goals was an own goal. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you talk about the girl they call Nana Ariana Allen. I mean, mm-hmm. she is she's a very determined player and she's a very smart player. And I think you know, with her and Lily Hines and Emma Dunlap working together, we'll see if they can get enough goals on the on the board. I. Can Culver score four goals like they scored against Rochester? I'm not sure I'd bet on it, mm-hmm. but it's going to come down to, I think, who can finish. Mm-hmm. Um, we're all, Also, the key is going to be how healthy is Sophia Heath, Culver's goalkeeper. Right. She left the game twice due to apparently like a back injury against Rochester and then came back in both times and actually finished the game. Mm-hmm. If not, they'll have to go with uh, Scout and their backup goalkeeper. Yeah. So that winner will play the winner of North Miami and Laville. Right, and we could have an Argus Laville sectional final. Yeah, which would it be uh, would be what you would probably anticipate. But we'll you know the two teams with the strongest traditions probably sure. in that sectional. Sure. But uh, if if it came out of Culver and Laville, that would be an interesting game too because sure. uh, Laville beat Culver two to one during the regular season. But that game, the winning goal wasn't decided until it like, wasn't scored until like less than two minutes to go in regulation. So that would yeah. be that would be an interesting matchup if that happened. But yeah. obviously. You look at the Lady Dragons, they won three straight sectionals, and they've been ranked in the top five all year. Yeah. So uh, we'll be there on Saturday night at 7 p.m., no matter what, because it's either going to be Argus or Culver, so one of our teams is going to be playing. So you're going to be there with me, right? I will. Yeah, so Val and I will have the call on uh, the championship. Another uh, uh, sectional uh, in the 1A boys that's going to be happening, uh, the championship is already set, and that's going to be... The cast and Comets hosting the Winnemac Warriors, so conference rivals meeting for a sectional championship. That's going to be uh, on as well. That will be at 2 o'clock on Saturday. Right, Winnemac beat North Miami 1-0 on Wednesday. Uh, cast and beat Culver 2-0. They also beat them 2-0 during the regular season. So, uh, yeah, somebody's going to win a sectional. Yeah. I don't believe Col- I don't believe Winnemac has won a sectional since 2001. Yeah. And I don't believe Caston has ever won a soccer sectional. So that would be... A big deal for whoever can win it. Yeah. Uh, Coach Burton has put in a lot of time at Winnipeg. Coach Sanchez has put in a lot of time in at Caston. Uh, you're going to feel pretty happy for whoever wins that one. But yeah. it'll be a rematch of a game played just last week at Winnipeg. Winnipeg won that game one to nothing. Mm-hmm. So I would expect a pretty tight, tightly contested, low scoring game this time. Yeah. Obviously, that sectional had been dominated by Argus over the years. Uh, you know, but they got moved up, and and so now uh, an opportunity for. One of our HNAC teams. Yeah. Thomas Fearens, look for him for Winnemac. Let's see if he can, if how he'll be marked. What mm-hmm. Kasten might have it, Kasten come up with a defensive game plan. And for Kasten, Jonathan Pacheco has been playing great of late. Let's mm-hmm. see if uh, he'll be a factor offensively. He, uh, Rowan Jellison is another uh, potential scorer or somebody that I'm sure Winnemac will have to be mindful of. Mm-hmm. We'll have that one for you on uh, on the web as well. That'll be a 2 o'clock, I believe. Um, Kickoff or I, what would you call that? Kick? I, they kick it, so kickoff. Yeah. So uh, you know that's going to be an interesting one there with Caston hosting Winnemac for the sectional championship. So a couple of sectional championships mm-hmm. on for you on Saturday in uh, boys soccer in, in the afternoon, and then uh, up at Argus the girls at 7 p.m. Uh, we'll go ahead. We'll take a quick break. We'll just uh, one more thing. Yeah, Valley girls. Thing. The Valley girls play Fort Wayne Concordia on Thursday night. That game will have been played by the time this airs. But uh, finishing up their first season as co- under coach uh, Mark Gordon, we'll see right. if they can win. Uh, we'll see if they can get to the sectional final. Uh, we would. That'll be the the uh, second game. The first game will be Leo and Columbia City. Leo, I think we talked about Leo last week. They're undefeated on the season, and they're ranked tenth in Class Two A. So yeah. we would have to imagine the Lady Lions are favored, but we'll see if Valley can get there. But yeah. Obviously, it's uh, it's great to see them playing, uh, having a team at least at Valley. Yeah, yep. First year for uh, the Valley girls. Mm-hmm. So, 
And the Valley Boys program is, you know, you, I guess we call it toddler by now, but I mean, in their seventh year. Yeah, a seventh or eighth year. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, they're they're not the, you know, tr traditional. You know, obviously Argus with fifty seven years in, so You're right. got a few years on them, but uh, they're, you know. Right. They're going in the right direction. And while we're talking about Valley Soccer, tip of the cap to Caleb Petkin. He really had a great career for Valley. Yeah. Good. So we'll, we'll take a break. We'll split it up here. We'll talk some volleyball because we got a lot of volleyball stuff to talk about as well. And, and Dawson Perkins. Dawson played pretty well in goal, but just he was under siege against Argus the other night. Yeah. But I was I was glad that Dawson gave soccer a try. I think. Yeah. If he, I wish he had started earlier because, again, when you're talking about a 6'7 goalkeeper. Sure. That gives you a little bit of an advantage. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So if you, an athletic six seven right, goalkeeper. He's right. not just a well, yeah. Anybody yeah. that can uh, mm -hmm. can basically do a high jump that's taller than you. So yeah, I mean that's that's pretty darn good. Mm -hmm. So we'll take a break. We'll be back. We'll talk some volleyball here on Talking Sports with Val. The lawyers and staff of Peterson, Wagoner, and Perkins LLP are here to provide the highest quality legal and professional service for their clients presently and for the future. From estate planning and trust, to adoption and family law, to appeals, probate, and more, Peterson, Wagoner, and Perkins has the knowledge and experience to serve you now and in the future. See a full list of services online at petersonwagoner.com. The Winning Edge is your local provider for all your sport and school athletic needs. From providing customizable sportswear to engraving trophies, the Winning Edge strives to help teams find their edge on the playing field. Call 574-223-6090 or visit their website at www.thewinningedgeathletics.com. Timbercrest Senior Living Community in North Manchester offers services for all stages of life, including independent living, where you can maintain your independence, assisted living in an environment that will suit your individual needs, nursing and memory care for those in need of full-time care. Licensed professionals provide rehabilitation services, including physical and occupational therapy. Call to schedule a visit at Timbercrest, a place to call home. Hey, welcome back. Here we're talking sports with Val, and uh, we, we've talked football and, and football, soccer. Uh, so now let's talk a little volleyball. It is a busy time of year, obviously, on the hardwood for the volleyball girls. Uh, coming down to the end of the season, a lot still at stake in conference races. Hoosier North Conference has been you know, locked up for a while with Pioneer. But the uh, they're the, not the hottest team going in the Hoosier North right now. Uh, no, you could definitely say that uh, the Cast and Comets. They and won ten in a row. Ten in a row. They had a huge win uh, in five against Triton the other night. Right, at Caston. They won their home tournament. Uh, you know, they they beat since last week. They won at North Miami in three. Won at North Justin in three. Won at Knox in four. Won their home tournament, uh, winning three uh, three matches in one day, beating Valley in the championship. How good does that win over Valley look now, right. especially the way Valley played against Rochester the other night? And then Cast and Beach Triton at home in five, a very, very good Triton team that's probably going to be favored to win their 1A sectional. Mm -hmm. Wow, the Lady Comets are the hottest team in the area going right now. Yeah, and they're going to be uh, down at Southwood. So, I mean, it's not an easy sectional, but boy, you know, yeah. who, who's going into that sectional that's any hotter than Caston? Right. Good news for Caston, they got a bye. The, they'll play the winner of the Southwood North Miami matchup. Um, so Southwood uh, beat North Miami the other night in three so I would imagine that Coach Schultz will be preparing to face Southwood mm -hmm. uh, who's I think 22-3 and three in the season so both of those teams are just red hot right now mm -hmm. but Caston did, did get a bye I want to give a shout out to we, we've, we've talked about Caston volleyball a bit this season but I don't think we've talked about Kinsey Mollenkopf that much but she has been really good really serving well mm -hmm. and Join Zimpleman in that back row. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I got to see uh, out of the corner of my eye quite a bit of that as, as we were doing the Rochester game. But, uh, you know, it was really impressive just to, uh, you know, Triton, really strong team in the Hoosier North. And right. that, that win locked them in at second in second place. Yeah. So, so. Yeah, Cass won 6-1 and one in the Hoosier North. Their only loss was two Pioneer. And that was in four. They did win a set-off Pioneer this mm -hmm. year. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, uh, and that's a trade. You know, Cassin was down two sets to one against Trident, came back and went to win four and five. So, yeah, yeah we've talked a lot about Maddie Smith and Isabel Scales all year. I mean, they're, they're six rotation players, the two setters. You know, they really have a nice chemistry there with Lowry and Harsh. Mm-hmm. So, and Maddie Smith, I mean, she, you know, she's just something else. And Abby Williamson is a blocker. I mean, everybody fills their role on mm-hmm. that team. Harness, she's she's been playing well too. Yeah, uh, Pioneers gonna have to make two trips down to Southwood. They they play on Thursday night, so they'll be taking on uh, Elkhart Christian. Should be able to win that one, but Lakeland Christian. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. what I meant. Yeah. I, I had the I had the location in my head. Yeah. So Lakeland Christian. Um, so they should be able to win that one, obviously. And, and Lakeland then, Christian has, I think, won one match all yeah, year. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, you know, that's just going to add a, a second trip for them. They'll be going and taking on Northfield if they win in that Thursday night match. So they'll be taking on Northfield then Saturday morning. That's a, yeah. obviously a different Northfield team than they faced last year in mm-hmm. the sectional championship. Right. Northfield is something like 7-15. and 15. This mm-hmm. year they were... 28-2 and two last mm-hmm. year. Mm-hmm. The second loss was to Pioneer in the sectional final. I mean, they're, yeah, not quite the Northfield team that, that they had last year. I, I would expect Pioneer to advance to the sectional final pretty easily, uh, even though they did not get a bye. Uh, you know, they, they lost to Front, you know, they lost uh, last Thursday to Frontier in five. I think they had a match point in that match, lost 16-14 in the fifth. And then they go two bet in the central and they lose in three. I don't think there's any doubt that Pioneer has played a strong enough schedule. I think Southwood is the only other team in the section that's played even a, that's played a schedule that you can compare to Pioneer's schedule. Mm-hmm. Obviously, Coach Finnecal makes sure his team is ready for the postseason. But I'd even put Pioneer's schedule maybe even a step above I mean, mm-hmm. when you talk about playing Zionsville and, the, and North Central and those teams. So yeah, I mean it's, now it's time to uh, Pioneers. Narrow down those rotate that the, the the rotations and who gets how much playing time. I mean, that, you know, I expect Coach Nice to have that figured out, and that will be very interesting, especially from that setter spot. Yeah, and I I don't know if he's still uh, there yet. I mean, I, I think he's mm-hmm. still trying to figure some of that out. They have a a big match with uh, Twin Lakes on Thursday night, so that'll be interesting to see how that goes. But. Mm-hmm. You know, Benton Central, I think they were something like 24 and, and 2 or 4 or something. I mean, yeah. you know, obviously they play a huge schedule as well. So it was a tough one, but, you know, they did lose in straight sets. So yeah. I don't think Coach Nyes was, was very happy with that. But uh, whoever... It's a, it's a confidence thing and it's a health thing. Because mm-hmm. uh, it would sure help to get Brooklyn Borges back mm-hmm. from her ankle and it would help to get Bell Blick and staff from her ankle injury. Yeah. I, I think Borges is probably more likely than, than Blickenstaff, it sounds mm-hmm. like. But, um, you know, whoever, Pioneer, if they do make it to that championship, whether they end up playing Southwood or Caston, they're going to they're gonna have a fight on their hands. Yeah, the 15-year sectional streak is, it, it, it hasn't always been easy. Mm-hmm. No, and it, it wasn't hasn't. easy last year, and yeah. I don't think it, it won't, doesn't figure to be easy this time. Yeah. Last year, though, they had a little advantage because they were playing at Pioneer. Yeah. So now they're going to have to make a, uh, a bit of a road trip over to Wabash County. Uh, TRC-wise, uh, that match on Tuesday night with Rochester and Valley, uh, Valley kept their hopes alive. They they ended up uh, winning that one in four. Uh, you know, Rochester had some moments in that match where they looked really good, and, and then they had some moments in that match where they... Didn't look so good. Yeah, I talked with Coach Aaron Leap afterwards from Rochester, and she said that just the frustration all year has been finishing. That again, Rochester was up nineteen thirteen in the fourth set. Mm-hmm. If they win that set, it goes to five, and then who knows? Right. But they, you know, Valley I think closed the match in a twelve to two run mm-hmm. to win that last set twenty five twenty one, and it's just the fin- the finishing that's been frustrating. Um. You know, Emily Hughes got hurt. Emily, I talked with Emily afterwards. She said she's fine, but she did need to get her ankle taped while the match was going on, mm-hmm. or taped or retaped. So, not having Emily hurt a little bit, but I know she. Did, I don't think Emily plays all six rotations either, so she mm-hmm. might have been out anyway. Uh, <coughs> Aaron Leaf said that when when Emily first got hurt, that Emily just didn't make eye contact with her. She's you know, don't you think about it? Mm-hmm. Don't you think about taking me out? I'm fine. Mm-hmm. But she did get, but she did eventually have to leave, and Rochester struggled when she was out. But I've seen times this year when Rochester played pretty well when Emily was out. I thought, mm-hmm. you know, I thought Kylie Houston played great against Valley. I mean, mm-hmm. 
But again, it was frustrating because just the, those finishing issues have come up and popped up all year. Mm -hmm. So we'll see. I mean, they've, they've got some chances to get some momentum back. You know, they, they host Whitco on Thursday. That'll be played by the time you see this. Then they go to Twin Lakes for that tournament. They, they've had very good success at that Twin Lakes tournament over the years. They, they've won it more often than they've lost it in previous mm -hmm. years. And then they get a whole week to practice to get ready for the sectional because they got to buy. Right. They'll play either South Central or Westville in the sectional semifinal. Um, South Central lost a tough one the other night um, to, I, I'm trying to remember who they played, but I know South Central plays Triton on Thursday night, so that'll have been played. That'll be a very interesting match to see how Triton, right. uh, South Central checks up because a pretty good Triton team. Right, a team that uh, right. Rochester beat in three. Right. South Central has two wins this year over Westville. They're in the same conference in the Porter County Conference, so you would have to imagine it's going to be the Lady Satellites playing Rochester in that mm -hmm. first uh, semifinal at 11 a.m. on uh, October 16th. I talked with Coach Aaron Leap about the draw. She said, yeah, I would have rather played South Central in the sectional final, but yeah. It might be kind of like we said with uh, Argus and Canterbury. That might be your de facto sectional championship game. Might be. Uh... Those two, in terms of the computer rankings, those two teams are far and away ahead of the other teams. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you know, going into uh, going into the by sectional, far the, by far they're the two best records. Yeah. Well, I don't know if Rochester's one of the. Yeah, Westville might have a slightly better record than Rochester, but the schedule is right, not even close. Right. So we'll have that. Uh, we'll be up at Bremen on uh, Saturday the sixteenth, and we'll have that eleven uh, a.m. semifinal game. As you said, it's either going to be South Central or Westville uh, versus Rochester. And then uh, if Rochester wins, then we'll have the championship at 7 for you. Right. And the other half of the draw, Bremen drew South Bend Career Academy, and the winner will play Laville. Yeah. So uh, you would assume Bremen would probably advance. In yeah. The, yeah. So, you know, we've seen that matchup before. They played both of those teams last year, Bremen and Laville. So, you know, we'll see uh, how that works. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so it'd be interesting. You know, Rochester uh, is the back-to-back -back sectional champion, looking for third, and I think it would be the uh, would that be the fifth if they could get it in six years? Is that right? It'd be the sixth in the last sixth seven and years. Seven years. Yeah. It was the fifth and sixth years last year. Yeah. So yeah, you know, and then on the other side of that matchup on Tuesday, the Tippecanoe Valley Vikings, Coach Durf. I mean, wow, what a season they've had. Uh, you know. Yeah. New, had you seen them play in person before? That was the first one yeah. this year, yeah. What were, your, what were your thoughts on the way they played at? I, I think I've said they're just a solid volleyball team that doesn't beat themselves. Yeah, I mean, there was there was nothing overpowering about them, but they didn't have service errors. Mm -hmm. uh, they did everything pretty well correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, they looked really good, and, and you know, they, they kept their hopes alive with that win in conference. You know, they still have to beat a really tough Southwood team. Mm -hmm. uh, that will actually be... Thursday night, so that'll be done by the time this airs. But man, you got to give them all the credit in the world. First year coach and uh, a lot of new players right. working into it. Third coach and Ashley Durf is their third coach in three years. I, I, I'm sure we mentioned that before on this show, but boy, when you talk about third coach in three years, it's not really good for the stability of the program. But boy, the, the players have responded so well. And not only that, but the newcomers have just meshed in very, very well. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, Avery Wagner and Michaela oh, Castell did not look out of place. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, Mallory Durkis, I mean, she's got all the shots. Mm -hmm. I mean, she can hit outside, she can hit middle, she can hit opposite. You know, Macy Kirkenstein, I think, has just done a great job as a setter. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, Braden Bainey was impressive. I mean, yeah. you couldn't get anything on the floor in front of Braden Bainey yeah. or beside her, <laughs> yeah. behind her, or anywhere. I mean, right. she just she was all over the place. Yeah, she's very very light on her feet and can mm -hmm. get to most anything. And there's you know a lot of service variety there too. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, so yeah, this it's it's a very intriguing team. Mm -hmm. uh, now they play Southwood at home. Obviously, they, if they Win that, they share the TRC, and then there's Wabash kind of lurking too. Wabash will be rooting for Valley because if Wabash can beat Peru and Valley beats Southwood, then we have a, we could have a three way tie. Mm -hmm. If of course if Southwood beats Valley, they win it outright. But you know then Valley, but the, the draw there's that Northwood team lurking. Northwood is twenty six and two. They're six and zero oh in the NLC. Yeah. They start to play a pretty good Wawa C team to close out their NLC schedule. That's also Thursday night. 
but as for Valley, I think they've got to like, even though they didn't get a bye, I think they've got to like their draw. They play a West Noble team that they've already beaten this year. And then if they win that, they play Jimtown. And I don't know if you saw my tweet. West Noble doesn't have any. West Noble's five and eighteen. They don't have any wins over a team with a winning record. Valley's eighteen and nine. Mm-hmm. Jimtown has one win over a team with a winning record, and that mm-hmm. was against Elkhart Christian. Yeah, a one eight team with a winning record. I'm, I'm not sure Jimtown has beaten a team as good as Valley this year. So if Valley can get by West Noble and Jimtown, all of us all of a sudden they're in the sectional final. But the Lady Panthers might be lurking there in the sectional final. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Northwest twenty six and two. They actually they lost their season opener to Penn, mm-hmm. so they've gone twenty six and one in their last twenty seven matches. Yeah. Well, you, you think about the TRC yeah. as and we move. Northwood's young, by the way. Right. They only have like one senior. Yeah. They are. They've got, they've got some really good freshmen. Yeah. From what I hear. Well, that's what I was going to say. Talking about youth, you know, you, you think about the TRC as you move into, you know, obviously we're still got a lot to go this year, but, you know, Valley's going to be. Uh, you know, bringing a lot of girls back. You got Southwood that's super young. You get that Wabash team. They're they're young. I mean, it's going to be a really really competitive conference for a couple of years. Yeah. With those teams, and then Rochester's got some some good young pieces. I know they're graduating four really good players again this year after having six graduate last mm-hmm. year. But uh, you know, you can't ever. Uh, there's there's more parity in the TRC volleyball wise than there used to be. Mm-hmm. For a long, long time, it was okay. Rochester's going to play Southwood, and whoever wins that match is going to go undefeated and win this win the conference. Right. It's not like that anymore. Mm-hmm. We had Northfield's emergence last year. Mm-hmm. McConaughey has been very, very competitive in sure. this conference. Even you know Peru's starting to get a little better. Mm-hmm. We're starting to see even the bottom, I think, lift up a little bit. Yeah, yeah. It's I, a really good Wal- Wabash with Coach Cromer. I mean, she has elevated that program. Wabash used to be. You would just walk all over them in three. It's not that way anymore at all, and they are yeah. they are talented. And like you said, they're going to be talented for a while. Yeah, you know? they got some size too. Yeah, yeah. I was, I was very impressed with them. So, um, what else? I think that uh, volleyball wise, Culver tough loss to Westville the other night. They won mm-hmm. the first set, but wound up losing in four. Culver mm-hmm. drew OD. Mm-hmm. They have they played OD twice during the regular season. Split those two meetings. Uh, beat him in five in their re- in their first meeting, and then the second time they played him at John Glenn in a best two out of three match, and they lost that one in two, but two tight sets. Mm-hmm. So again, um, that'll be a, that should be a very competitive match, and whoever wins that Culver OD match will take on an Argus team. Argus received a bye. Argus has won only one match all year, mm-hmm. so you would ha- Culver beat Argus in three when they played earlier this year. So if Culver can get by OD, you'd have to think they'd be favored to beat Argus and get to the sectional final. Yeah. Other half of the draw, Triton drew lacrosse, and the winner uh, will play. Uh, Who's the other team? West Central. Okay. They're all the way over there? Okay. Yep. So Triton is the defending sectional champion. I, think, I want to say Triton's won six sectionals in the last seven years. Mm-hmm. You don't think about them as a volleyball powerhouse, but they, every year they, they find a way to navigate their way through that sectional, and, they're, and the sectional is at Triton. So. Right. Just like it was last year when they won it, so you'd have to think the Lady Trojans will be favored. I, again, they, and Triton plays a very good schedule too. When you talk mm-hmm. about, and they've got, they probably got the most height in that sectional. I, I, again, I, I haven't seen OD play, so maybe or lacrosse play. Maybe I shouldn't jump to conclusions, but I, I can't imagine that another team is as imposing in the front line when you talk about Veers and Hensley. Right. Yeah, they have uh, they have probably the the biggest front line for that sectional. I would I would assume so. Yeah, I would think Triton would obviously be your your uh, sectional favorite, but Culver, you know, if they can get by OD, obviously they they've got a really good shot to get into the championship. Yeah, and that's a young Culver team. Yeah, really young. Let's talk about the Winnemac Lady Warriors. Uh, they got Alyssa Villanueva back the other night. Gave uh, North Judson a competitive match, and they lost in I think lost in five in that one. Mm-hmm. And the good news for Winnemac, not only did they get Alyssa Villanueva back from her quarantine, but they got it by which is a good sign. Winnemac will play either Boone Grove or Rensselaer. So the good news is Winnemac will only have to make one trip to Boone Grove right. for the sectional. Boone Grove and Rensselaer played earlier in the year during the regular season. Rensselaer won that. Mm-hmm. Rensselaer also owns a win over Winnemac. So if you're Rensselaer, you're probably saying, hey, we got a pretty good draw. But remember, Rensselaer hasn't won a sectional since 1991 mm-hmm. in volleyball. So they're, they're not accustomed to this type of success. So I think that sectional is going to be wide open. Well, this is the healthiest that uh, Winnemac has been all year, uh, yeah. as far as having everybody there. So, 
obviously it's going to be tough for uh, Coach Caston to just throw everybody together and, and hope that it all meshes. But you know, this has got to be their best shot that, yeah. they, that they've had all season. Right, and I think with you know with not only Alyssa Villanueva but you know Jewel Connor and uh, Sydney Thompson, I think that they can finally have some some. Uh, I don't know if they're necessarily going to intimidate you at the net, but they can have some some bulk, some height at the net, some mm-hmm. something that can be uh, somewhat imposing. I, you know, they can have to get some good blocking, and the, their serve receive is going to have to be really good. Mm-hmm. But again, I think the draw was pretty favorable, and the sectional is not as tough as it's been in previous years. Right. North, in the other half of the bracket, North Judson drew Hebron, and the winner yeah. will play North Newton. I don't know who comes out of that. I, yeah, maybe Judson's he, dominated for a Judson's while. Judson's dominated for a while, but this is not the North Judson team that even had last year, so mm. who, who knows who comes out of that threesome yeah. into the sectional final. Yeah. The other the other player that impressed me for uh, Winnemac uh, McKenzie is at Hines. Yeah. Uh, you know, I was down there on the floor in the uh, Pioneer game. And yeah. She's ever been as tall as I am. Yeah. You know, I was like, why? Is, why and why she had did, a better vertical than you. Well, yeah. I would hope so. <laughs> I can't get over that piece of paper on the deck, you know. But uh, yeah, I mean, she uh, she's very imposing, you know, about yeah. about six two, and yeah. uh, really, uh, you know, did some good things against Pioneers. Yeah, so. so if you can have a, a multitude of options, that'll make Kaya Campbell's job as a setter a lot easier. Mm-hmm. I bet Coach Croft would like to have her on his team. So I guess it's been tried, but she just doesn't want to play basketball. But. Mm-hmm. Right, and I, I want to say there was a pink out night the other night when Winnemac hosted Rochester. They lost the match in three, but the proceeds went to Kaya Campbell's aunt, who's dealing with cancer right now. So mm-hmm. thoughts and prayers are with her. But that's it's just awesome that they're just they've always been thoughtful. They they've done it, I think for a different member of the community every year. They've had that pink out night, and that's yeah. they, were, they had it raffled off a few uh, gift bags and their gift uh, I don't know what you call it gift boxes and yeah. Yeah, Campbell, one of the two seniors with uh, yeah, Villanueva. Right, and Kaya's sister is on the JV team, so mm-hmm. uh, that meant a lot. Yeah. Okay, any other volleyball notes you want to talk about? No, I think that, yeah, I think that's about it. Yeah, okay. I, I think uh, it's going to be, uh, it always seems to be the same. You know, we always talk about it being the same teams every year. Well, maybe not this year. Yeah. Uh, I think it's going to be lead to a very, very intriguing week. Yeah. It's going to be uh, a very interesting, you know, obviously at Southwood, you know, with Caston going in the way they're going in, uh, you know, boy, that'll be interesting over there. Bremen, it's going to be interesting. Uh, Triton, who knows what could happen up there. And, uh, you know, Boone Grove, it seems to be uh, wide open up there. So Yeah. Be interesting. We'll be back, uh, you know, with, with more of that next week as uh we get into it. We'll know obviously the the semifinal round matchups going into uh, you know the the championships uh, between next week's show. So we'll take a break. We'll come back. We'll wrap it up. We'll talk some cross country and uh, tennis in the uh, final segment. We're talking sports with Val. With great participate. Where does greatness start? Here in the classroom on the diamond. In the pool. On the field. Where will your greatness take you? To better grades. To more friends. Yeah! Be great. Participate! The Winning Edge is your local provider for all your sport and school athletic needs. From providing customizable sportswear to engraving trophies, the Winning Edge strives to help teams find their edge on the playing field. Call 574-223-6090 or visit their website at www.thewinningedgeathletics.com. Back, we're going to wrap up the show here for this week. We're going to talk some cross country and some tennis Big weekend last weekend for cross country, the uh, conference championships, TRC, Hoosier North, all across the state, I guess everybody was doing conference mm-hmm. championships, but uh, some really good things going on. I know we had a, uh, a school record set in the Hoosier North with uh, Violet Montgomery uh, breaking 20 minutes and uh, the, Ooh, the boy, school record. Oh boy, was she record. fast, 1955. Yeah. I finished in third place. 
Yeah. How about Maggie Smith of Winnipeg, 1950? Yeah. It, it was just a great three team. It was just a great race between three girls. When you talk about Maggie Smith of Winnipeg, Jocelyn Faulkner of Triton, and Violet Montgomery of Pioneer, and Faulkner ran 1954. I mean, she was. So uh, one, two, three was within I'd five be, seconds. I'd be curious to know what the Triton school record is. Yeah. I, I'd, I bet that's that's in the, that's probably up there too. It might be your mom. It might be your mom. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, wow, that's amazing. So they were they were all right there within five seconds. One, two, three. Yeah. So what a job by Maggie and what a job by the Winnemac girls to pull that the team title out. You know, Maggie ran nineteen fifty. Cadence Hoover was fourth. She made all conference. Kelsey Wegner was fifth. She made all conference. And uh, let's see, uh, oh, Alexa Sheets, she made all-conference, too. She was ninth. So when you have all four all-conference runners, that's going to bode pretty well for you. And mm -hmm. Winnemac won it. Pioneer was third as a team, and Caston was fourth. How about Delaney Strasser, seventh place for Caston, and she made the all-conference team. Violet Montgomery, we mentioned her. She was third. And Kylie Ferris was eighth. So yeah. both of them made all-conference as well, so kudos yeah. to them. And on the, on the boys' side, the, the Pioneer boys... Yeah, the Pioneer boys, I think we kind of predicted that they were kind yeah. of the, the front runners literally coming in, and they yeah. they proved us right. They won it. Um, uh, let's see. Um, you know, again, it, it's kind of the pack. I mean, Jackson Baker was third, Leighton Dot was fourth, Jack Cooper was eighth, and Austin Brook was ninth. So four all-conference runners. Mm -hmm. Nobody in the top two, but four all-conference guys, and they were able to win it. And uh, we should mention... Uh, you know, Caston, they had one all-conference runner, Austin Day. He was second behind the winner, Colby Wagner. Of course, his sister made the all-conference team, and Colby won the boys' race, and his teammate Christian Cardenas was fifth. Mm -hmm. So, and then let's give a shout-out to Destin Green of Culver. He made honorable mention, and Caleb Stinson of Caston made honorable mention. Yeah. So, as we kind of predicted, it was a, a very fast course. It was a very fast course, yeah. Uh Right, uh, a lot of a lot of runners have set their PR at Winnemac Town Park because the pavement is a pretty flat course, not too hilly, mm -hmm. uh, not too many, not too many uphill, you know, no no agony hills there. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, a lot of runners have, have set their PRs over the year. I, I, I think we I think we kind of nailed it. I think we we've been predicting that the Winnemac girls and the Pioneer boys would be favored, mm -hmm. and I think that's how it turned out. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you were over at TRC, uh, had some good I stuff was. going on over there. Yeah, the Rochester girls and boys both won conference titles. First time since 2013 they both won. Of yeah. course, for the girls, it's three years in a row they won it. Right. Uh, boys win it. The boys, I think, was the more dramatic one. We were kind of we were kind of wondering, uh, maybe this time last week, we were kind of wondering, okay, it looked like a three-team race between Rochester and Wabash and Manchester. Well, during the Maconaqua, they were up there, too. Uh but I thought the key for the boys was, you know, Peyton Hyatt. He ran 1732 at Valley. He ran 1813 at Culver, or 1812 at Culver Academy the week before. So he chipped 40 seconds off his time. You know, that, that Culver Academy time was unlike Peyton. Mm -hmm. You knew he would respond, and he did. He just had that look like, I'm not going to be denied in this race. And, you know, again, but again, having said all that, Rochester wins with the pack, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, Peyton was fourth, Dylan Steininger was fifth in 1742, and Chris Rohr was sixth in 1752. Mm -hmm. So it was just that pack, you know, uh, Isaiah Wittenberg and McConaughey won the race, and then uh, there was a Wabash kid and a Manchester kid who finished above that Rochester trio, but Rochester's second beat everybody else's second, Rochester's third beat everybody else's second. Yeah. And if your third beats everybody else's second, that just right. it makes things a lot easier. But having said that, how about... You know, West Steininger, you know, eighteen twelve, and then Adrian Ochoa ran nineteen ten. West finished tenth. He made the all conference team as well. Top in the Hoosier top ten make all conference and the TRC top twelve make all conference because yeah. you know, TRC is a bigger conference, so bigger all conference team. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, and then Adrian Ochoa was he finished top twenty mm -hmm. nineteen ten. I mean. Wes went from eighteen, I think eighteen eighteen at Culver Academy to eighteen twelve at Valley. Improved his time by six seconds, even though I think Valley's a slower course. Mm -hmm. You know, generally you look at these times. I mean, again, comparing the Winnemac course to the Valley course, you can probably about twenty to thirty seconds. Mm -hmm. It's about a twenty to thirty second difference in time. I mean, the Valley course that that wood section is pretty steep. Mm -hmm. That that's tough. Yeah. 
So, I mean, this was just, it was just, a, it was just a determined Rochester team, and they just, you know, again, they, 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 they won it with the pack, and that's just a great tribute, especially to those two senior leaders in Hyatt and Dylan Steininger. Yeah. Do they go through the woods twice, or is that LaVille I'm thinking of? They just one time through? Just one time through. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That might be LaVille I was thinking mm -hmm. of, but, uh. Yeah, so t talk about the girls because, you know, they just finally got up to strength about a week and a half ago. Finally, How dangerous is this Finally, thing? and then Lucy Rangel misses the meet. She had a medical procedure done on Monday, and she could not make it. So you have your basically your third best runner is out. Mm -hmm. We were kind of wondering, and then can they hold off the Manchester pack that's kind of been right on their tails all year? Uh, and they did. And we we were counting. I mean, we were counting numbers. We we were unsure until we got the results. But Rochester won it, um, and they put four girls on the all conference team. Madeline Callaway was hold on here. Madeline Callaway ran twenty oh nine. She was second. Zoe Seward was third in twenty nineteen. So again, when your second gets past the finish line before most teams first, you know, it, right. it, it gives you a chance. But then we were running about, worried about the rest of the pack. Araceli Ochoa ran great, twenty-one thirty-four. Cut her time about from about by about twenty seconds from the Culver Academy meet again on a slower course, really. Mm -hmm. And then Kendall Bradley, twenty-two oh nine, and she finished tenth and she made the All Conference team. Elena Bodie, twenty-three oh two, and Maddie Heinzman, twenty-three twenty-three. So you've got, um, but you only, they only had, and then uh, Maddie Broyer ran thirty-one oh nine. But again, they get when they get Rangel, that'll give them another girl in that pack who's going to chip away. Um, unfortunately, will it be good enough to beat the Warsaw team that has dominated the sectional in recent years? I don't know. I wouldn't. I'm not sure I'd bet on it. But they keep getting faster and faster. And again, Madeline for her second race of the year to run 20:09, when maybe she's not has she been able to condition herself the way she would like to? Mm -hmm. And on a fairly slow course, I mean, that's a great sign. Obviously, Abby Jordan from McConaughey won the race, and, you know, she looked great, but, boy, that, it's it's a great sign that the, the – and like Coach Eric Lynn has been saying, those girls, Madeline, the, Madeline and Araceli, are kind of pushing everybody else up. Mm -hmm. So then uh, as we move forward into uh, this week, uh, tomorrow – Yeah, they hope to have – they expect Rangel back for the Manchester sectional, so, yeah. yeah. But again, the Lady Tigers of Warsaw, they, I think they won the sectional 10 years in a row. Mm -hmm. So Rochester Valley, Caston will all go to Manchester, right? Is that right? Rochester Valley, Caston, Argus, and Culver. Argus and Culver, yeah. And then uh, Twin Lakes are, is the other one, Pioneer and... Logansport is where the other sectional is, and that's where Pioneer and Winnemac go. Pioneer and Winnemac, okay. And the regional is at Culver Academy this year. and so Back the Culver. Top five teams at both of those sectionals in both genders. So you'll have 10 girls teams and 10 boys teams at Culver Academy on October 16th. Okay. Plus the top 10 runners on non advancing teams. So even if your team doesn't advance, if you have one of the 10, 10 fastest times, you'll so go that way. The Logan and, and Manchester sectionals will go into. Right. Culver. They, they both feed into Culver. Um, Chesney Miller ran, I think, 21 25 from Valley. Uh, she'll. Almost certainly get one of those top ten spots. We'll see if Bailey Buster can maybe get one of those top ten spots as well. Uh, and for the Valley boys, uh, Isaac Whetstone's been really coming on. Ran 1957. Uh, we'll see if he can get one of those top ten spots. Uh, Evan Myers will probably be in contention for one of those top ten spots as well for Valley. Okay. But yeah, it was it was uh, it was it was good drama. Mm -hmm. We were because we didn't know that Lucy Rangel wasn't going to run, and apparently she apparently it was just kind of a minor. Uh, medical procedure that she had but she was just in a lot of pain and couldn't run but yeah. from what we heard she everything's should be good. A, everything's good long term good Any, anything else on the cross country course you want to talk about I think Brian Hernandez Rios at Grace College I think set another f cross country record cast and grad yeah so sophomore this year I think yeah 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 so but yeah, yeah. He's, he's been doing uh, a lot of uh, good things up there at uh, Grace. Yeah, along with uh, Mallory Hyatt on the girls' side of Grace. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yep. the Rochester grad. She's a sophomore as well, right? Yeah. Yeah. But uh, yeah, the Caston boys, I think Austin Digg, I don't know if the Caston boys will make it as a team, but Austin Digg will almost certainly make it as an individual. Mm -hmm. And then we'll see if Destin Green from Culver can make it. 
Yeah. But that would be awesome if the, the Cavaliers can do it. Because yeah. Culver won the Hoosier North uh, Junior High Boys race. Right. In fact, they went one, two, three, four, five in that race. I saw that. That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's not like there's nobody else running. Right. I mean, that's almost unheard of. One, two, three, four, five, and only one of the five runners is an eighth grader. Really? So you're going to have to wait a little bit. Wait a <laughs> Uh, Wait till the fall of 2020. Some of them are sixth graders, right? One of them's, I think, one of them's a sixth grader, three yeah. seventh graders, and one eighth grader. So yeah, yeah. yeah. you'll have to wait till the fall of 2023 before we see all of them on the same team. But yeah, we'll be we'll be doing Walker sports with Val as we're in here. Yeah, but uh, yeah, that, that's pretty neat uh, to see one, two, three, four, five. Mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, that's impressive. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, so the only other thing I guess that we really have to wrap up. As we talked last week, the um, when we filmed last week, the Rochester Zebras tennis team had not yet played. Uh, uh, kind of figured on the results being what they were. Yeah. And, you know, they, they lost 5-0 to uh, the Culver Academy team. I was talking with Cody Smith, who spends a lot of time at my house now, um, and he was saying that the uh, he's number one doubles, if everybody knows that, but... He was saying that the team that they played against the academy, they were the one kid was from Utah, the other kid was from, gosh, somewhere out west. And he's like, "How long have you guys been playing tennis?" And pretty much since they could walk, and and they have lessons, and and they, you know, so you, you kind of knew that result right. was coming. It's been how many straight sectionals? Eighteen 15, in a row. Eighteen, 18 in a row. Yeah. yeah. The last Culver Academy hasn't lost a sectional match since two thousand three, when they lost to Plymouth that year. And yeah. the next year, Plymouth and CMA were put in different sectionals. And mm -hmm. well, Culver Academy hasn't lost a sectional match since. Right. And that's I think ten times in those eighteen years Rochester has lost to Culver Academy in the sectional final, yeah. including six times in the last eight years. So it's it's nice to go to the academy because they have great facilities, but you've got to play them at one point. So. Right. I mean, they have great facilities, but they also play a lot of tennis. I mean, mm -hmm. and you get kids from Utah. <laughs> yeah, they have played tennis since they were walking. Right. And again, you you say, boy, what a what a rotten draw. You get Culver Academy in your sectional, but I mean, so do you want to be in a sectional with Bremen? Mm -hmm. Want to be in a sectional with Peru? Want to be in a sectional with you know Warsaw, Columbia City? I mean, it's just there's no easy sectional out there. Yeah. You know? Congratulations to the Bremen Lions. They yeah. wound up winning the regional. They beat Culver Academy three to two on Tuesday in the semifinals. They beat Peru four to one in those in the regional final on Wednesday. That's a that's two teams that are really really good. Really good. Yeah. Uh, Bremen is ranked number twenty seven in the state. Culver Academy was ranked number twenty one. Uh -huh. So that was maybe a mild upset when they yeah. beat Culver Academy three to two. So uh -huh. yeah, I mean yeah, CMA's kids yeah they they have a lot of advantages, mm -hmm. uh, but they they're not impossible to beat. Mm -hmm. Yep. And Bremen is a program with a great, great tradition in tennis, too, and they, sure. they pulled it out. So yeah, that it could be intriguing this year in terms of Carmel only beat, Carmel will be at the semi-state, but they only beat West Lafayette 3-2 to the other night. So that's kind of news it's in their regional final. So yeah. is Culver vulnerable? Who knows? Yeah. Or is Carmel vulnerable? Cold. Who knows? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, uh, the, the Munster and Bremen in one semi-state, Carmel and... Uh, Harrison, I think, in the other semi era. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, if you want to go to, if you like boys tennis, yeah, go Saturday at Culver Academy. I think it costs five or six bucks to get in. It's not free like sectionals are, but yeah. Yeah. Good tennis. So, uh, yeah, it's going to be uh, it's gonna be interesting over the next couple of weeks. A lot yeah. of uh, things going on. And meanwhile, Valley lost to Columbia City 5 0, and they're. Uh, quarterfinal match and that was a Columbia City team that wound up winning the sectional outright so yeah. again no seniors on either of our local teams Yeah, all three singles players for Rochester are juniors so they mm -hmm. they will be loaded with seniors next year yeah. the only problem is that Culver Academy out of their seven varsity players only two of them are seniors so it's yeah they're not they're, 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 <laughs> they're not going men. anywhere they're, either right. yeah. yeah so and that's going to be interesting too because usually you know you have your number one player that graduates and then everybody gets a chance to, to buy for so I, uh, that'll be interesting to see how Coach Atkinson does that next year with a lot of players coming back. Obviously, your three singles, right. your your number one doubles is a it will be a senior with uh, Tanner who will be a sophomore. So right, and R Robert and Jake they were they were one of the best two doubles teams in the area. They only lost two matches all year to Peru and to CMA in the sectional final. Yeah, what what year are they? Oh, you got me on that. 
I got you. Oh, I stumped you. Uh, <laughs> it's not that. You got me. I think both sophomores, but I could be wrong on that. Yeah. I think Robert's a sophomore. I don't remember with Jake. Yeah. So but I interviewed Jake on on Wednesday, and he made it to his choir concert. At time, I was really I was proud of myself. <laughs> I was like, you didn't tell me you had a choir concert. I wouldn't have bothered you for. Well, he he had to, you know, he had to be interviewed. I, I guess. I mean, it's, yeah. it's an opportunity to get interviewed by Val. I mean, you're not going to pass that up for a choir concert. Yeah. I mean, I tell me your goals, your dreams, your. I I still your, I still remember. What did we have for breakfast this morning? I still remember Macy's freshman year. I don't remember what game it was. It was very early in mm -hmm. her freshman year when. You pulled her off to the side mm -hmm. and interviewed her after the game, and was like she made it. Let's go. Her career's over. Let's <laughs> wrap it up, put a bow on it. Val interviewed her after a game, mm -hmm. so you know it, it is a big accomplishment for somebody to get interviewed by you after a game. You don't interview them if they didn't play well, you know. So if you if you hear Val say, "Hey, can I interview you?" That's that's big stuff. Okay. So. <laughs> Well, Delay the choir concert. <laughs> he could play, push it back. I, I'm, sh I'm sure yeah. that he could go in there and say, "Look, I was being interviewed by Val." They'd be, like, "Oh, yeah. no problem, no <laughs> okay. problem. We'll restart the concert." <laughs> so yeah, a lot of stuff going on. Obviously, we have uh, football coming up tonight. Rochester on the road at North Miami, Valley on the road at Wabash, Culver hosting Pioneer, and Winnemac hosting Caston. That's all going to be coming up tonight. Uh, we'll have uh, two of those games. I'll be up at Culver for Pine at Culver Pioneer, and then the Winnemac crew will be getting the Winnemac Casting game. Uh, sec a sectional draw for football coming up on Sunday at 5 p.m. IHSA TV. So check that out. We'll see where all of our area teams are going to be playing, and we'll talk more about that next week um, as we move into uh, volleyball. As we get to next week, we'll have that first round. Uh, actually, when we film it, the first round won't be done because we'll film on Thursday, and so we'll have to uh, kind of anticipate what's going on there. But um, yeah, we're we're winding the seasons down. Week eight in football. We got one more week of regular season coming up. Volleyball is going to be starting. Sectionals coming up very quickly. Cross country sectionals tomorrow. So good luck to all the uh, area runners as they go to their uh, respective sectionals in Logan Sport and North Manchester. Um, anything else? I don't think we, we didn't give Jack Kaiser a shout out last week. Yeah. After his interception return for a touchdown against Wisconsin, so yeah, I didn't get a chance to watch much on the uh, the Cincinnati game. I know it wasn't the results that they wanted, but I didn't uh, have a chance to watch that when. Cincinnati is tough on defense, yeah. and you know their 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 quarterback is a really outstanding player. Ritter and Notre Dame a little a little iffy on the quarterback situation. I, I don't know if Brian Kelly has even announced his quarterback for this week's game at Virginia Tech. That's yeah. a tough environment. They always play inner Sandman when they run out on the field. Oof, it's, yeah, that's a night game too. From, from what I heard, you, from what I heard, Virginia Tech is one of those places where if you're a college football fan, you want to go there at least once in your life. Yeah, to see it in Blacksburg. I was told that Notre Dame was one of those places too, and I, sorry, but I wasn't real impressed with it. I guess, but I, I think that uh, you know Purdue is is a good place to go watch a, a football game, and not that they have good football necessarily all the time, but uh, yeah, that that's going to be interesting. I I heard somebody throw out a name for a, a Notre Dame quarterback, Jack. Yeah, <laughs> he could do it. Yeah. I mean, it's probably been a few years since he's thrown a football. He didn't throw it a whole lot at Pioneer, but uh, how, how ironic would that be? That would somebody... affect Tommy Reese's play calling, I think, a little bit. Right, right. Wait, you want me to run? We're, we're going to run wing T. We're going to run Wildcat? Wing yeah. T, yeah. Yeah, let's do a little wing T at Notre Dame. Let's we'll see mm -hmm. how that goes. So, no, that would be fun. So, you know, tough loss for Notre Dame, but, uh, yeah. you know, Jack continues to, uh, you know, impress. It's just uh, amazing that a little kid from Royal Center can. Yeah, do and, what he's doing. And that Liberty team, I, I haven't kept too close of a tabs on Liberty, but of course Tristan Schultz from Culver and Brody Brown from Winnipeg are both on that team. Yeah, Tristan's got to be in his what fifth year, sixth year I there. Think so I, yeah, I think he had an extra year. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, and Brody's probably a senior as well, isn't he? By now, he's he's got to be getting up. Yeah, there. yeah. You know? 
Jillian's a sophomore, so I think, yeah, Brody's probably, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so. All right, well, we're going to wrap it up. We'll be back next week talking some more sports with uh, Val, and I uh, hope you enjoy it. Thanks for tuning in. Oh, Val Unified Flag Football. Yes. Playing uh, in the regional. Yes. Against Valpo on Saturday. Good luck to them. Congrats on winning the sectional to Coach Walker and his team. Yeah, we we may have uh, it's at Wawa C. That's what I was told. Oh, okay. I, I, that's what I was told. Okay. By the uh, uh, Valley kid. Okay. So he was talking about going up there. He yeah. May, he may be wrong. Don't don't. Well, I know Drew. Drew's our buddy, and congratulations to him. Mm -hmm. He's played four years of unified flag football. Yeah. If they win, I think they got to win too. But if they win, they go to the state championship game, which they two years ago they won the state. I think lost the state championship. They game lost two years the ago. game. Yeah. Okay, but they went to the state. Mm -hmm. So yeah, congratulations to them. That's a you know that's a great program, and it has really picked up a lot of momentum over the last few years as far as the number of teams that there are that are playing that. Right, and I was thinking of Jeff Shriver and the late Jeff Shriver and mm -hmm. the the role he played and and just he kind of got that thing rolling. He got for that him. thing rolling, and he coached them, and he just you know he brought about a whole bunch of positivity. You know with that. I just remember him. I mean, he's got the headset on. Yeah. You know, this is flag football, but he was taking it like it was uh, the Super Bowl. Yeah, yeah. So, of course, he, uh, gosh, just the kids. I mean, they just loved him. Mm hmm So, and he, he loved them back. So, mm -hmm. pretty amazing. All right. So, good luck to the, uh, to the Valley uh, Unified Flag Football team as they uh, try to make it back to the state uh, championship game again for the second time in three years. All right, now we're going to wrap it up. Okay. All right, thanks for tuning in. Talking Sports with Val. We'll see you next week. Is your bank closing? Are you unhappy with your current bank or financial institution? At First Federal Savings Bank, we've been serving your community for 55 years. And whether you're in need of a home loan, commercial loan, checking account, financial services, or insurance services, we'll be here for you tomorrow. Make the switch today. And remember, we don't want to be the biggest bank, just the best.